Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Welcome to Beyond the Gatekeepers. I am Bishop-elect Vanessa M. Brown, and I am your moderator slash host for the evening. And we are glad to be back with you after a two-week hiatus for the holidays and the new year. And we are talking about something that's very serious on tonight. We are talking about the war on democracy. I would like to ask all of our Facebook Live friends and family, um, as well as YouTube, to please, please, please share this Facebook page on tonight. This is a conversation that you want to you want to listen to tonight, and you want to hear uh, these powerful men and women of God who are with us on tonight. And so we'll start off with our first person. They are not a guest. They are with us every week. Um, they are the co-host and co-moderator, really. She is the presiding prelate of the Fellowship of Affirming Ministries and also the senior pastor of City of Refuge United Church of Christ in Oakland, California. Bishop Flunder, will you greet our Beyond the Gatekeepers audience for 2021? Well, uh, good evening and, and uh, early night. Uh, for those of you that are on the East Coast, it is a wonderful thing to be back with you uh, all of our gatekeepers family, I think I should preface everything by saying how much I deeply, deeply appreciate the uh, thoughts, uh, prayers, and condolences in the loss of my brother from so many of you all, some of you I have not connected with since uh, Leonard passed away, but thank you for the ways in which you reached out beautifully. It's been such an encouragement to my heart and to my family. Um, I am so glad that we are able to have this conversation tonight. We have had a day. It has been a day filled with both incredible joy and appreciation and filled with some real concerns about the current state of our nation, some unprecedented events, particularly in our lifetime. And so it's going to be really, really important that we talk tonight and talk through this in some ways as community. And I believe we have the right folks here. We encourage you to put your comments and questions in the chat. We need to talk as a community and we need to celebrate as a community. And so I'm so pleased to be back with you. God bless you. Thank you so much, Bishop Flunder. And our guest on tonight is not a stranger to us. He is none other than Fred Reverend Fred A. Davey. He is the Executive Vice President of Union Theological Seminary. Reverend Fred, will you come and greet the people and let them know uh, what, you're, what you're doing over at Union Theological Seminary? Hello, everyone. Hey. Uh, it's, uh, it's a real pleasure uh, to be with you. I want to thank uh, my friends and colleagues, uh, Bishop-elect Dr. Vanessa Brown, and your bishop, Dr. everybody's bishop, Dr. Yvette Flunder, Bishop Yvette Flunder, for having me uh, join tonight um, in this conversation. Uh, it's a real pleasure uh, to be with my, with my friends. Um, I am the Executive Vice President at Union Theological Seminary, uh, where I do uh, work on administrative and management for the seminary, but I'm also involved in the external work of the seminary's life, uh, working with the seminary on faith in the public square. Uh, particularly for the, where the, the, there's an intersection of faith and public policy. In addition to that, I uh, chair uh, New York City's uh, Civilian Complaint Review Board, which is the oversight agency for the NYPD, Civilian Oversight Agency for the NYPD. Um, and then I also serve on the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom. Uh, it's a, a federal entity of nine people um, that um, advise the White House, the State Department, and the Congress on, uh, on international religious freedom and freedom of expression and belief. Uh, so I'm really pleased to be here tonight to join this conversation on this uh, momentous day. Um, uh, I think it will um, be a day of significance in the history of this nation for a very long time. So I'm, I'm really pleased to be with you all. Thank you so much, Reverend Fred. It's a joy to have you with us on tonight. And certainly our last guest who will be in with us in a few minutes is Bishop Carlton D. Pearson. He is no stranger to us and he is not really a guest either. He is here with us every week. He is an author, progressive spiritual teacher and thought leader. And we will greet him when he comes into the room. 
I want to move right into our conversation, if I can, um, on to that. Oh, he is here, Bishop Pearson. Yeah. Will you, Will you please greet the people? Hi. Hey, people. I've been here. I thought I was in. I forgot to put into the conversation. Excuse me. I've been jumping and rejoicing over um, the late some of the the latter events and mourning over what I'm seeing uh, at the same time in Washington. But let me just say that. Voltaire, and I've repeated this many times, said, um, those whom you can persuade or convince to believe in absurdity will commit atrocities. And we're dealing with a bunch of people, at least 70 million Americans, and that's more concern of a concern to me than an outgoing president who's a mental case. Um, these people believe absurdities, absolute absurdities, so they will commit atrocities, they'll do anything and they're prepared. The worst has not come yet. They're gonna, it'll intensify between now and January. So this conversation tonight is very important and I'm honored to be here. I love you, Bishop, or you know that. And Bishop elect and Reverend Fred David, God bless you. Good to see all of you. Let's enjoy this evening. Critical Thank time. You so much. Thank you so much, Bishop. So let's, I was talking to Bishop Linda earlier and I was debating, are we going to start with the war or the win? And I think we decided we're going to start with the win tonight. And okay. so we're so happy to talk about the win. Okay. Uh, we know the win is about Georgia turning blue. Oh. Two, two senators that are going to Congress. And I'm going to let you all start talking about this win of Reverend Dr. Raphael Warnock, who is an alumni of Union. I know Reverend Fred's gonna have a lot to say about that. And Reverend, I mean, not Reverend, but Ann Ossinoff, amen? And amen. so Bishop Linda, let's start off with you first. Well, um, I'm tickled, you know I am. Um, we served together on the Auburn Senior Fellows team. Um, and I have known Reverend Dr. Warnock for quite some time. We've been all over the place together. To, and I'm able to say that he is a incredible, genuine, uh, genuinely kind, uh, genuinely informed, uh, powerful. He has a tendency to speak when he really has something to say, <laughs> which has always been quite something as far as I am concerned. But even more than that, he is the spiritual progeny in so many ways of the work of Dr. Martin Luther King. And he does not just uh, show up in that spot uh, to receive curb appeal. He shows up in that spot because he really has in so many ways embodied that presence. Um, and it shows when he is uh, at Ebenezer. But I think in, in so many other ways uh, when um, when, when John Lewis died, um, it was just such a wonderful moment to, to be in the space where someone had a real heart for the movement and was not simply facilitating, if you understand what I mean, but had a real heart for the movement. And for him to go from all of those spaces to all of a sudden tell us that he was going to run for a senatorial position. We said, so we all, you know, leaned in. We said, now, brother, uh, is this something that you really <laughs> want to do? Because, you know, politics are politics and, and they suck up all your, <laughs> your time and everything. And then sometimes to get the money to do it, you have to sometimes compromise some of the things that you want to say and then try to gloss over some of the things that you said. Uh, but he told us then, uh, shared with us, that he would be his authentic self. And if he could not bring his authentic self to the, to the process, then he simply could not come to it. And sure, as old folks say, show enough. Show enough. Show enough. He brought his authentic self and he won. How incredible is that? It is mm. such a statement in Georgia. And I applaud him and I celebrate him. He's a true brother, as many of us know, but he brought his authentic self. And I am so pleased to be able to be his colleague and wish him well in every way. God bless. Excellent. We're so happy for him. When I saw that he won, I thought, of course, of John Lewis. And I thought when Osnoff won, I thought of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. So I am excited for both of them. Reverend Fred Davey. 
Thank you. Yeah, um, Ra Raphael, I'll call him Raphael because I've known him for a long time. Dr. Warnock, um, I've known probably now for over a decade to know him well. Um, he was, uh, in addition to be being a union alum, he has three degrees from union, two masters and a PhD. He's also a trustee. But how I really got to know him was we, James Cone was his, the Reverend Dr. James Cone, the, the founder and the originator of Black Liberation Theology, uh, was Dr. Warnock's advisor. Wow. And when I got to Union 10 years ago, I got to know Dr. Cohn, and we hit it off really, really well. Um, and, um, and so we had this triangle, actually maybe it was a quadrangle, that included um, uh, Raphael, Dr. Warnock, Jim Cohn, and, and Reverend Dr. Kelly Brown Douglas, who was also a protege of Dr. Cohn, and obviously a colleague of, um, of Dr. Warnock. And so um, uh, Dr. Cohn and I spent a lot of time talking about a lot of things, but one of the things that he confided in me was his illness, uh, that he had had cancer and it went into remission. And then when the cancer came back, I found out later he only told me uh, and didn't tell anybody else, including his children, until he was close to death. But one of the things he told me to do, Dr. Cohn told me to do when he was close to death, was to call Raphael. He said, because I've already told Raphael that I want him to preach my funeral, and I think it's close to time. So I called Dr. Warnock, I called Raphael, and I said, he said, don't tell me this. I said, you know, it, it, it is indeed the case. And, and so he and Kelly Brown Douglas and I and some others actually planned the funeral for Dr. Cohn. And then, of course, Raphael eulogized Dr. Cohn at the, at the Riverside Church. You get to know a person. Uh, in those moments, you really get to know who they are and what they're made of and what they're really committed to behind the scenes when nobody's looking. You get to know them. Uh, they, they say a, a sign of a person's integrity is what they do uh, when, they're, when no one's watching. Um, and so we developed a bond there. He's also a trustee. Um, and we work very, very closely on any number of issues uh, related to union. Um, and so when he told us he was going to run for Senate, we sort of like uh, Bishop Flunder said, you know, uh, do you, are you sure you want to do this? And then once he convinced us that he was sure, we said, what could we do to help? And the union commit community rallied. We held fundraisers. Um, we held uh, webinars where we were able to have conversations about his race and what he was doing and what the issues uh, were. Um, when John Lewis died, he actually invited I actually went down for the funeral. He invited me down. And, you know, we got to talk more about the race then. I talked to some of his staff. Um, and then just Sunday, uh, I flew down just for the day so I wouldn't have to quarantine. Um, I flew down for the day and did canvassing in Union City just outside of Atlanta near the airport. And he and I texted uh, back and forth on that trip. So it's been, and, and what, what um, as Bishop Flunder said, what Raphael brings is um, you know is a real commitment to some fundamental values that are that are radically inclusive. Uh, he was real clear that he was running a campaign that includes black folks and white folks and poor people and rich people and LGBTQ people and anybody else who wanted to join that broad coalition, and that he was going to be concerned about uh, folks who live at the margins. Um, that he was not going to lose that in that King Kingian tradition. Um, so it was a joy. I mean, you know, the, the race started out yesterday on CNN and you saw these big numbers. Uh, and I told my spouse, I said, Michael, you know, we need to turn the TV off and watch some of these series we've been watching because this thing is going to close and it's going to get scary. Uh, and sure enough, but I knew they were going to win. I just just like I knew Biden and Harris were going to win. I knew they were going to win. And sure, sure enough, uh, the, it got close, but they pulled back ahead. Uh, and and we have the we have what we have tonight. It's a historic moment. Um, a guy who any of us could pick up the phone and call, and he would talk to us. And now he's the first black U.S. senator elected from the state of Georgia. Yes, yes. God is good, and uh, he's got his hand on that plow. Raphael does, and um, I think we should have our hand in his back and let him know that we're there to support.
Excellent. Thank you, Reverend Fred. Yeah. Bishop Pearson. Well, I'm I'm I I think I'm happier about this election or just as happy about this one as I was the Biden-Harris uh, win because uh, this just changed the congressional culture. This changed the fabric of the Biden-Harris uh, uh, administration. I met Dr. Warnock, in fact, as soon as I heard that he was running, I started writing checks. I was in Atlanta a few weeks ago when he, uh, when he first announced and I had somebody who runs on the go to the church that morning uh, but I've consistently supported them, and I don't support uh, political uh, campaigns financially. I haven't, uh, you know, Obama and, and a few others, but this is the first time I got that engaged because I so believed in him, but I believe in the synchronicity and the involvement of the consciousness of ancestral support. This is a prophetic time for the race, for the culture, for the consciousness, the character, and the Congress of the United States of America. Uh, this man is walking in prophetic footprints. He knows that. I met him, I think I was at some event for Tyler Perry's place, Dr. Barbara King, at the same time I met Dr. Lewis, and he walked over and introduced himself to me and said he'd been following me since he was a young man. I, I don't remember exactly how old he was, but since he was a child uh, in ministry. And he said, I'd love to get to know you better. I said, I saluted him for, and told him that he was in a prophetic position as pastor of Ebenezer, that he was following in a legacy that I believe was orchestrated divinely. I didn't know at that time he had any inclinations toward politics, but he is the man. And his uh, his responses since he's been a lecturer, or since last night, every time he's been on television, his words are perfect. His responses to questions are like a, like a skilled pro. He knows what he's doing. He's been prepared for this for generations, even before he was born. I think there is a, a esoteric, spiritual, mystical anointing on him, as well as I believe on, on Ossoff, who is a, a Jewish immigrant's son. This is all powerful. Georgia is kicking it in. Georgia, Dr. King would be thrilled. His daddy would be thrilled. His sister who died of the organ would be thrilled. This I get chills thinking about all the kinds of, from Tyler Perry buying property that used to be owned by slave, um, civil rights activists, uh, soldiers, and uh, there's just a lot of powerful signs we're getting along the way. The Trump situation, what you see is the old collapsing in front of us and them having a panic. But these winds have triggered it even more. We we got this. And again, as I say, when George Floyd called his mama, all the mamas heard, the ones that were, were women that were dropped in the seas of the Atlantic crossing from Africa to either Britain or here. I think the, the, the dead slaves that were hurting and, you know, you've heard of haunted houses. This one is holy houses. The, there, there, there's a holiness with this. There's a holiness with the selection. There's a holiness with that man. There's a holiness in that man. And uh, you're going to see him blossom in a way we've not even seen. All of you who've known him personally and touched him individually, uh, those fingerprints are on him, which mean, and thank you for being there for him. But this is this is glorious. I want to shout. I think we all want to shout, Bishop. This is so good. And I know that we cannot, at least I cannot call Raphael Warnock's name and Arsenal's name without calling Stacey Abrams' name. That's Absolutely. She is the, girl, she's the woman. And she had a team of people. She didn't do it by herself. But certainly we have to give her credit. Absolutely. Um, for getting those people out to vote and for doing all of the work that she has done uh, to make sure it happened. She happened to make it happen. And I'm excited about her future and what's yeah. in store for her. Um, a powerful woman, not just her, but her and her sister. Yeah. They both uh, you know, did a lot of work um, on the campaign trail to make sure that these votes uh, got in. And we were able, Georgia was able to turn Georgia blue. Blue. Well, time in forever, you know, um, it's just a very powerful thing to know um, and to uh, experience even in my lifetime that this actually happened and that we are going to get to control the Senate and the House and Congress. And what a powerful thing for us. When I talk about a win, it's a win for all of us. It's not just a win for one group of people. It's a win for everybody all across the board. Now some of those things that have been uh, voted upon in the previous administration can be overturned and done away with, and we can move forward as a nation. Bishop Flunder, I know you want to say something about Stacey Abrams as well. 
That's a dangerous woman. That's what I have to say about her. She, she uh, is laser focused uh, when she's focused and she's focused most of the time. And uh, I, I, I love the way in which certain things at different times in our history were a mystery to us to some degree, even as it relates to the body politic, you know, that there are some things about the systems, about the way that uh, political machines work nationally and statewide and locally that uh, can be a bit of a conundrum for our people. And one of the things that Stacy is extremely skilled at is making people understand the process. I think one of the tricks that um, have been perpetrated uh, over the years on black people is uh, we've been played a few times uh, about folks making us think like tertiary education was outside of our reach or home, buying a home was outside of our reach or running for public office was outside of our reach. And we needed to sort of stay in our place and not allow ourselves to be in these other places where black people are not essentially. So it was made to be uh, above us or beyond us in some way. And I love it when these folks come along and say, oh, honey, that ain't about nothing. We can do that. I love it when folks when folks take all of the mystery out of it and just show us the path. Yeah. And that has happened for us. That's why we we golf now and we play tennis now. You know what I'm saying? Right. <laughs> and a few other things that we thought were outs. And we run for senator positions now. And we uh, see ourselves as able to manage million, a multi-million dollar uh, corporations and such because we it's been demystified. She has the spiritual gift of demystifying the things that we at one time thought were impossible. She has made us believe as it relates to politics that all things really are possible. We need more of that in our community because we are capable but we drank the Kool-Aid and we really do need mm -hmm. to see ourselves as capable. Once we touch it, when we touch golf, we turned it around. When we touch tennis, as old folks say, we turned it around. <laughs> and oh education, we turned it around. There are all sorts of ways that that spirit needs to evolve in our community. So that's what comes to my mind. She's dangerous. She's more dangerous than they have than they really know. Just let's keep an eye on her and prayer covering her. Indeed. Indeed. Bishop Pearson, you want to say more about Stacy? Well, I, as soon as we start, the first thing I want to say, and I said it last night, I started saying, Thank you, Stacy, like I was saying, thank you, Jesus. When when he when he won and it looked like he was going to win, I said, Thank you, Stacy, from the get-go. I've been following her and what her voice. You ticked off the wrong woman. The governor of Georgia and the, the attorney general have to bow to her. Because that woman without being the governor, governed, without being the governor, took the whole state blue. You mess with a black woman that knows her stuff and you in trouble. The whole world is saluting, respecting, almost bowing to her. And uh, yes, yeah, she that's that 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 feminine essence, that, that divine feminine that's about to be pre prevalent during the age of Aquarius. I think if that doesn't offend some of you say, there's a sweet anointing on the woman to birth things. She carried that, incubated, and pushed it out. She pushed two senators into Washington. Stacy did that with, with her group, the people that stand around her with her organization. And she's more powerful there than any position she may be offered in Washington. And she may be one, and she should offer, be offered one. But to show way that out when it comes. But she's our icon for right now. We just celebrate her. She's the mother that birthed her. Indeed, Reverend Fred. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I can't, I mean, I want to echo what uh, Bishop Flunder and Bishop Pearson have said uh, about Stacey Abrams. Uh, there's, there's something about people who get the politics of their state uh, and black people who get the politics of, particularly the racial politics, and then are able to operationalize a process that addresses the oppressive elements that come with the politics of a particular state. I think Reverend Barber has been able to do that in North Carolina. Uh, I think Barack Obama was able to do it in Illinois. 
And I think you see uh, Stacey Abrams and Raphael Warnock doing it in Georgia. Raphael grew up in Georgia, in Savannah. So he knows the subtleties of Georgia life. I think Stacy came over from, uh, was it Mississippi? Um, and early and, um, and got to know some of those same vibes. She realized what they did to her in that governor's race and then was determined to fix it. Yeah. And she did. And, um, and they tried every way to Sunday to get around her, but, uh, she put it in place. And I think, you know, we praise the Secretary of State as we should in Georgia for standing up to Donald. And we praise the um, uh, Attorney General there and even the governor who defeated Stacey. But the, what they knew was that they had to come through Stacey if they were going to try that stuff again. And they weren't ready to do that. Um, and um, and she, she made them more righteous people than they perhaps otherwise would have been. So I really appreciate uh, what she's done. I agree with Bishop Pearson that, you know, she can choose to go in the administration. I think she'd be much more, will remain much more of a valuable person outside doing the things that she's doing, helping other states understand what she understands about Georgia and how you replicate that, what she's done in other states. So we guarantee that people's votes are counted, that there is a fair fight, um, as she says. Um, and um, um, I think America uh, is just blessed to have her. And, um, you know, she will, um, she will live on um, in the history of this country as well for a very, very long time. Absolutely. And I think the governor, the attorney general, as well as um, uh, the secretary of state did not want Stacey smoke or fire. They, no. they didn't want to play around with her. They wasn't ready for her. And they decided they needed to go along with what needed to happen in a righteous way. And so I'm excited about that. I wanted to say a little bit about Raphael Warnock and his statement today, or I think it might have been yesterday, that he made about his mother, who's 82 years old, and said that, he, he, yeah, he talked about her, you know, picking cotton right there in Savannah, Georgia, right there in Georgia, and how the same woman was gonna be able to go to the polls and vote for her youngest son and use her hands again to vote for her youngest son. I thought that was a very, very powerful statement. And I also wanted to say something about Asanoff and him being 33 years old and never either one of them, neither one of them ever going into public office before. This is both their first times. And I wanted to say to young people that are listening in that nothing is impossible. 33 years old, nothing is impossible. If they can do it, you can do it too. You can do it for your city. You can do it for your state, wherever you are, your locale. If you want to run for something, go out there and do it. Bishop can I speak to that just for yes. a second, Bishop, Bishop Lett? Um, I'm going to speak from a New York perspective just for a minute if I can. We just elected the first out gay Afro-Latino to the US Congress, Richie Torres, who was a council member at age 26. And we just elected the first black gay member to Congress in Madera Jones, right here in New York State and New York metropolitan area. That is to say to young people, to young people of color, to young queer people, to what Bishop Flunder said, it's all open to us now. Yeah. There, the only limitations are those that we place on our own spirits. Now, people will place other kind of limitations on us, but there should be no limitations on our spirits. Because if there's no limitations on our spirits, on our imaginations, then we can overcome the other barriers and oppressive measures that people might put in our way. So I, I wanna I wanna highlight Stacey Abrams, I wanna highlight John Ossoff, Raphael Warnock, Madera Jones, Richie Torres, all young people, all ethnic young people, if we can count Mr. Ossoff's Jewishness as an ethnicity, um, and all who are breaking barriers. I, I am I am inspired. 
about the future because of people like them. And I hope that the young people who are on this webinar tonight will take notice, as you, as you said, Bishop, Bishop Alec, and, uh, and, and understand that all of this is now open and available to them. Indeed, Bishop Flanda. I, I saw my congregation uh, last Sunday on the, on the list of things that we have come to know that more has been exposed to us uh, in this process than we knew. Now, one thing we do know a lot about now is the Electoral College. Yeah. We know the Electoral College from the back. We know the Electoral College from the front. <laughs> we know it from the top. We know it from the bottom. We know when it started. We know when it works. We know when it doesn't. Because these experiences have been incredibly informative in many, many, many ways. And I have a young man also, he's a part of our congregation who's running for public office, he's 28, in the city of San Francisco. And he keeps us and has kept us informed pretty much over time. But now we are really informed. The crisis has done wonderful things yep. to get us deep six in public policy. So to everyone's point, I'm hoping that many more young people and young adults will begin the process until we brown up, and I mean brown it up, the Senate in particular. We just need to just brown it. It needs browning in many, many ways. I'm praying that that reality will happen such that Dr. Reverend Dr. Warnock will not be uh, unique. Good. I want it to be a real caucus Good. in that bastion of white men in dark suits. I really do want to see that happen in this nation. Yeah. Wow. And, and if I could, I would just say um, that last point about the browning. Mm -hmm. It's what's driving people absolutely out of their minds. And it's the, the sort of the, the, the mythic uh, uh, power of whiteness has been exposed for what it is. And whiteness is becoming a minority among minorities in America, and it is driving people yeah. clear yeah. out of their minds out of their minds and there is no one so far who's taking the lead to help folks to know how to make the transition and so a demagogue like trump comes along and people are scared they're frightened their world as they knew it white being white is no longer enough and they don't know what to do donald trump comes along and says well i'll tell you you just blame the other. You make them your problem. You make me your savior, and I'll fix it. But what he's done is he's almost turned them into a Jim Jones moment because when all those folks came up to the Capitol to the, today, if the folks, the law enforcement in DC had responded to those people breaking in the capital of the United States of America, the way they did to the Black Lives Matter folks marching around the street in DC this summer, if they had responded in the same way, there would have been a major bug bag in DC. Now, I think they should have been more forceful in what they did in terms of law enforcement, but he, caught, he, he essentially called a whole lot of people to lay down their lives, not for the country, not for higher values, but for him because he's gonna save their whiteness. It ain't happening. The country is browning. It needs to brown, it's gonna brown, and everybody needs to get with the program. And folks like Ossoff have an opportunity. Folks like um, uh, Andrew Yang have an opportunity, as well as our own people like uh, Raphael and. Richie Torres and Madari Jones to help lead us into this new era. But right now, I think people are just 
I think a lot of our Anglo brothers and sisters have just lost their way. Um, and, and a guy like Trump can come along and snatch him up and just make them go nuts. Somebody okay. just go ahead. Somebody just sent me a text uh, that um, Ken Copeland and Mario Morello are on live, and they're just they're celebrating the fighting spirit of the president. That he's just not going to stop. The spirit of God is on, and they're making fight the good fight of faith and onward, Christian soldiers, and all that mentality, which is poisoned from the whole mentality of imperial colonialistic thinking of King James being King Jesus. And that whole mentality, which is so twisted, uh, t Trevor from New York, or from uh, what's Trevor's last name from South Africa? Um, the Noah. Noah Trevor. Noah. Noah. He said Trump lost, Loeffler lost, Purdue lost, Mitch lost, and I'm just here laughing off my ass off. You just talk about <laughs> <laughs> the senator. The Lord told me to tell y'all about that. It was a blessing. That's great. There's a lot of people signed the, the, the evangelical Christian movement. I have to bring this out is mm -hmm. imploding. Mm -hmm. the, the church as we know it is imploding, but mm -hmm. it's been imploding a, a while. It's about to publicly explode because what they're going to expose behind all of this insanity and religious bigotry and dogma and racism, which is the base of slave trade. Uh, and, and and the slavery mentality, it's all crumbling right in front of us. Those people are so desperate in Washington today. So they would climb walls. Now, if that had been people of color, they'd have blown them off with guns. President said the mayor of Washington, D.C. asked for the National Guard. He denied it. When they had to hustle Vice President Pence out, he called them and told them to get out there because they felt the weight. Those folks are so angry, they would have killed anybody. And uh, But they didn't shoot one Bullet. This is the national. The, the Trump's been telling these folks to come for weeks. They should have been prepared for this. There's some under. There's something. Uh, somebody on the inside that's connected that allowed access to Nancy Pelosi's office. Absolutely. And I'm, they actually got her hard drive. What's that guy doing sitting with his feet and taking oh, a picture? Yeah. Absolutely. Well, this, this is this is not acceptable. And some sedition. That's treason. That's insurrection. All of them need to be tried and prosecuted. I, I don't want to jump the gun, uh, Vanessa. I know you, you have a plan, but right. I'm, I'm, that's burning inside of me. We've got to deal with, deal the fact with that these lawmakers have become lawbreakers publicly, and there's been no accountability. But 13 days from now, five minutes after 12, my soul gonna rejoice. I've been watching the inaugural, but out of the White House into the jailhouse. That's what ought to happen, and it might. <laughs> This is good because yeah. it went right from the wind to the war. Yeah. yeah. Right from the wind to the war. And we sure. saw whiteness on full display today at our nation's capital. I don't know if anybody else saw it, but I saw it. Yeah, I we did. Saw whiteness on full mm -hmm. display in broad daylight. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Steamrolled past police officers and steamrolled into. Uh, the Capitol building and actually the nothing happened. Like when you see the footage of everything that was happening inside the Capitol, something had to made you wonder how could this be yes. without being an inside job? An inside job. Mm -hmm. I want to just turn this around and take it back to you all to talk about what we saw today. The war on democracy is what we saw and I want to give each of you a chance to say something about it. And Bishop, you already talked about the evangelicals. Mm -hmm. um, and I were, were, were talk going back and forth because, you know, Paula White has been the ring leader of this the whole entire time. And so she tweeted, I always have and will denounce violence, lawlessness, and anarchy in any and all forms. I have deep convictions for all people to have protection over the First Amendment and freedom of speech. We should be able to do this without becoming violent. I ask all to continue praying. Well, that didn't help because they were violent and somebody yeah. did get killed. The woman was killed today. She wasn't mm -hmm. just shot, she died. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We don't have a name yet and we don't know who shot her, but it but happened. In the mm -hmm. Right? And so we need to talk about these things on tonight. And so I want to start again with Bishop Flunder 
to talk about this war on democracy and what we saw happening and unfolding before our eyes on today. There's a common denominator in almost everything that we've said tonight. Um, and it is the issue of race fear. It's, it's this, this sense of diminishment for a superior uh, or a self-endowed, essentially superior group of people who are absolutely terrified of losing power, position, and place, prominence. They're, they're terrified. Mm -hmm. And then and so it, it gets painted over with politics. It gets painted over with religion. And in fact, if you think of everything that is on, that are the planks that are on the, the religious rights um, platform, it has something to do with that. If, if it's the LGBT issues, it has to do with the, the absence of um, what they perceive as male superiority and um, having children, let's put it that way. If it has to do with abortion and the control of a woman's womb, it has to do with the low birth rate, really in so many ways of white children. If, if it has to do with keeping the immigrants from our borders, it has to do with the fact that the immigrants are not people of, of, of European descent. You know, if it has to do with China, okay? It has to do with China's ability to to produce so much that we need <laughs> and 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 75 percent of everything we have on and drive in and use for technology <laughs> comes from china we want to be able to have the stuff but we want them not to get so much money you understand so it still has to do in some way with wanting um, a particular race in particular to succeed at the loss in some way of others. Now it gets covered up with a whole lot of, you know, uh, Christian talk and religious talk, but it does have to do with the, the last real breaths of white superiority and supremacy. The white male superiority and supremacy. And it is not dying easy, but it is dying. And what I saw, when I looked out over that crowd, I said, there it is. Here we go. There were some sisters that got together not long ago and tried to start the Proud Girls. I don't know if you all saw that. As a partner organization to the Proud Boys. And these were women who wanted to also have a voice, essentially, in the miasma of politics and, and fighting and war and conspiracy and all that, that the fellas, they got a note back from the Proud Boys that said to them, if you really want to be a proud girl and help and support Proud Boys, stay home and have babies. Uh. I can't say it any clearer than that. Essentially, that is the, the atmosphere. Strength at someone else's expense. Strength at someone else's expense. For me to be big, you have to be small. For me to be great, you have to be diminished. That is the underpinning of this nation. That is the design in so many ways of just about everything that it was worked into law. It had everything to do with land owning. It had everything to do with slavery. It had everything to do with diminishing women and keeping the vote from us. It had everything to do with pushing back people at the borders, trying to survive. And it is the last breath. And I'll say it again, because my grandbaby, when he becomes an adult, people of color will be the majority in this nation. And that is terrifying because with that goes the power. And one more thing, the old families, which made their money, and some of them really philanthropic now, you know, the Gettys and the Kennedys, and I could say a whole lot, but, but they didn't all start that way. Hallelujah. They started to run in liquor. You understand what I'm saying? The slight prostitution, and, <laughs> and they were land barons, and they were slaveholders. You know, they became philanthropic later on. The Trumps didn't get that uh, uh, email. But they became philanthropic later on. The heart of what I'm saying is that these old families are dynasties. And there were certain things that were supposed to be handed down, like Trump got it from his daddy, and then he 
had it and he wants to give it to his children. He wants them to be a legacy. He wants them to be the next president so that there's a, a an empire of a sort in the way. But the thing that has messed this up is the tech industry because the tech industry doesn't come from the old families. It comes from these weird people like Elon Musk. We're just still trying to figure out exactly what all he is. We don't know. It's like you look at him, he's saying, now what? He's an alien. What yeah, where, where are all of you from? It's a lot of different things. We want to with a whole lot of money. A lot of money, but they are obscenely wealthy because tech took over a lot of the other things. So wealth has now been moved in a manner of speaking. I mean, big, big wealth to a place that is outside of the sphere of understanding even for most of these folks. So they are, to, to your point, Reverend Fred, they are definitively feeling that they are becoming dinosaurs and do not and cannot have the power to do the things that they should, it should have passed down to them from their legacy. It's why it's not working like that anymore. It's just not working. And it is terrifying this whole entire group of people and the folks that hold it up. So indeed, indeed. And yeah, and and I would just thank you, Bishop. Um, and I I would just I would just sort of uh, tag on. And 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 uh, Bishop Barber makes this point. It never worked for most white people. They just believed that it did because they wanted to believe. Mm -hmm. It never worked. And the only thing that kept this thing from bursting open for the longest time was. First slavery, then then Jim Crow. And now that this thing is a little bit more democratic, a little bit more open, you got to compete on a on a on a on a level playing field. Um, where again, whiteness is not enough, but you got to compete with everybody else. Folks don't know how to do it. Now it can be done, but you got to learn how to do it. And you just can't say, well, because I'm white, I'm better. Well, no. And that's the, that's the demonic nature of racism. It's not just that it destroys the souls of the people who are oppressed by racism. It destroys the souls of the oppressors. It destroys the souls. Superior, thinking you're superior to another person is the most destructive attitude that you can adopt. And thinking that you're superior based on the color of your skin, the accident of your birth, your location in, in, the, in the economic pecking order is simply evil. It, is, it erodes the soul. And these folks don't have anything to replace it with. The evangelicals should be helping them to replace it with the gospel of Jesus Christ that they propose to profess and embrace and instead, they're feeding them more of the same stuff. They're just giving them more of what's making them sick. And most people who are who are white supremacists have a profound uh, inferiority complex, hmm. and that's why they come out with that stuff, trying to be prove something about themselves. They have wealth, but they do not have worth. We didn't have wealth coming up. But we, my parents and grandparents and God, but they taught us self-worth. So no matter what they did to us, we always knew who we are. And that's, that's, that is endemic among people of color, of all colors. We had, especially in a white dominated world, we had to value our worth since we didn't have the kind of wealth they played with. Now they, the word Democrat, Democratia, uh, Democratia in Greek, Demos meaning people, Kratia meaning a, a reign, a rule. Or, or you know, some kind of power, people power. That's all what, what, not the minority, but the majority has the power. The, the, most of these white supremacists or superiority people have an issue with not being the majority. They really are afraid of people having the power if they aren't the people. So subconsciously, they're attacking what they think diminishes them. And they, that shows that they are psychologically already diminished. They are threatened by change. 
They're threatened by a powerful female. They're threatened by a powerful non-black person, a non-white person. And they won't say that, but they're showing it. That's what we're seeing. Donald Trump was the, their last ditch white knuckle uh, uh, control or, or grasp on what they're, they're having to give up. It's being taken from them, literally. Before we see the great building, for the next little bit, we're going to see a lot of demolition. I'm just telling you in the audience. Um, Bishop elect that the, your audience that that there's going to be a lot of dust and a lot of explosions and implosions and a lot of demolition, a lot of other revelations and explosions behind this event today. When it comes out, what really happened and who was behind it, all of us are going to be stunned. Mm -hmm. There's some darkness. This, the scripture talks about spiritual wickedness in high places. I say spiritual wickedness in high and hidden places. But since the universe is correcting itself and perfecting itself and purging itself, it's unveiling. It is exposing what needs to be expelled out of its system. You can resent it all you want, but if you resist it, you're going to fail and they're failing. Trump is failing and they're failing because they resisted the change that God ordained. The universe has said, I'm shifting this out. Correcting of the universe, global warning, all of that is, is about to be fixed right now. That's what's in process as we move into this next great age. So I rejoice today. We're seeing the best and the worst of, of this, this decade and this century. We're only 21 years uh, into the, the 21st century and things that worked very well and very powerful and even very prophetically in the 20th century are not going to work in the 21st century. I spoke with a presiding bishop of a large denomination this morning, his wife, and they realized that change is taking place within their movement and in the movement and the church world and the religious world and all of that does hold this the thou thing of king james mentality and 16th century king's english that's crumbling in front of us we used to even say when i was really serious about casting out a devil i'd get when it wasn't coming out right i'd say satan the lord rebuke thee and if when i, when I throw that the on there <laughs> i thought god would honor my power for more <laughs> We all say, Father, we thank thee. That sort of credentializes the prayer. Well, we're moving away from that pretty fast. And so I don't know what's going to be replaced with, but it'll be powerful, it'll be poignant, it'll be prophetic. I believe that. I took a note because when this began to happen on the Capitol today, I didn't know what was going on. My mother, 82 years old, she called me. She said, Nessa, you watching TV, you see what's happening? They done stormed the Capitol. I was like, what? What you talking about, Ma? And I turned on the TV and I started to take notes because I knew that Bishop Flunder had basically already told me yesterday about everything that was going to happen. She told me Warnock was going to win before he won. She told me that there was a war on democracy and they were going to do something down at the nation's capital. She was just running it down to me and we needed to change the title. I'd already had a flyer done. And so I started thinking about everything that was going on and I looked up the word fascism. And when I looked it up, it said political philosophy, movement or regime that exalts nations and often ranks above the individual and that stands for a centralized autocratic government headed by a dictatorial leader, severe economic and social regimentation and forcible suppression of opposition. And what came to me is that what we are witnessing and what we have witnessed today was yeah. fascism and white nationalism. Yes. Right before our eyes. Glory and why churches, churches are, are supporting it. Yes. yes. Because they are fascists. And yes. sponsoring it. Yeah. You think about the definition. And then you understand why they think he's sent by God. If you yeah. understand what I'm saying, because they can get with that. That yes. whole way of being. And let's just say our, our theme of Reverend Davey for, for our, our conference for the Fellowship of Affirming Ministries is have you got good religion? That's what we mm -hmm. call it. Because we understand that that religion has taken a terrible blow and has a terrible crisis of credibility mm -hmm. in this present atmosphere yeah. for many yeah. people. Yeah. And the question is, uh, how do we... How, how can we get in bed with fascism? Well, because it's, it's a part of what we practice. That's true. Read the definition and then let's think about how we were raised. <laughs> and there's no question about absolute authority. Touch not mine anointed. That's it. 
and do my prophet no harm. You're going to wake up dead if you do. <laughs> I promise you. You go. So that that reality does not surprise many of the people who who lean in that direction are people who are from faith based organizations and churches. 100%. Yep. Because it's a part of our history and it's something that we need to grab hold to and turn it. Yes. So that we can yeah. find the prophetic and we can find the gifts and we can find the talents and we can lift people who are not in the pre-designated positions of power. There's so much we can learn from this. But anyway. Yeah. But to, really quickly to prove your point, Bishop Wanda, and I'm going to go to Reverend Fred and Bishop Pearson. When we talk about evangelicals or conservative Christians, Pastor Mark Burns was there. And we all know who he is. We know that he has, you know, uh, basically worked with Donald Trump the whole time and was on his faith committee and all of these different things. These people are yet to hold him responsible for what took place. Do you know what he said? It was not uh, Trump supporters today. It was Antifa that stormed the White House. This is his tweet. I'm not making it up. This is his tweet on Twitter. It was not yeah. Trump supporters. It was Antifa. We looking at people in mega hat, mega hats. Yeah. And you talking about it wasn't them. This is how the lengths that they are going to to support this man still in the midst of everything that has happened. Reverend Fred? He don't know what Antifa is. That's what oh. it is. Yeah, he doesn't. He don't know Antifa from Antisa. He just don't know. <laughs> he just heard that somewhere. I told him months ago to stay out of the Trump thing. He's called several times since he realizes he made an error. But the, the crowd, the white crowd, so loved his rhetoric, his black preacher style, the way he moved the crowd at the convention. <laughs> uh, they were crowning the King of Kings and Lord of Lord almost in two. And he loved it. That. And then they, when they did the research, they found out what was really there, they dropped him. But he's still trying to justify his error in judgment. And a lot of black preachers and a lot of white preachers and people that supported this man know he's made a fool of himself and them and our country. The person who's rejoicing the most is Vladimir Putin. This is exactly what he wanted to show in the world. And common sense tells you that if our number one arch enemy is pushing for a person to be in the White House, that's the one we shouldn't be supporting. But these people just missed it. 70 million people missed it again. And then and, 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 into our, our uh, secrets. Say that again. While he is using t technology to tap into the secret of our nation, the he's same behind. Vladimir Putin. He's behind all this. He's gaining from it. He's learning from it. They, if, if China was to call our loan and he and they get together and want to take us under, this is the time to do it. America has never been in such a weakened state. Out of touch. Today showed that our police enforcement, our our National Guard was out of touch. It made us, that's the nation's capital. We're not talking about Albuquerque, New Mexico, Tulsa, Oklahoma, or Wyoming. This is the nation's capital. And they went into the building, all the way into the Senate chambers, into the, the, the Speaker of the House's office and put his crusty boots up on her desk and smiled and sat in the Speaker's chair. You don't, if those if those had been black folks or people of color, they would have stopped them with guns and bullets. And he, left, and he left her with a note, said, "We will not back down." Right. He put a note on her desk, "We will I'm not back you, down." That didn't happen without inside support. We've got to talk about that. There needs to be a criminal investigation, one of the most severe, starting right now, to yeah. find out how that happened. Somebody needs, some heads need to roll. Some people need to go to jail. A lot of people need to be fired. This cannot happen. Donald Trump is headed toward prison. Biden is kind enough to probably pardon him, but he might not this time. This man on 12.05, I mean, New York's coming after him. The, the, arch, the uh, attorney general there, I've heard her many, many times, a brilliant black woman, knows her stuff. She's had four years to investigate this idiot. And she's got him and he knows he's got, him. he doesn't care about this country. He no. talking about, he wants the people to have $2,000 uh, in a uh, uh, stimulus check. He don't care if they have $2. Right. 
Right. He did that to run for election in 24. He, everything he does has a, has a motive behind it. Mm-hmm. And, and it's clear to so many people, why not the so-called people of faith? Mm-hmm. They don't see it because they don't want to see it. Yeah. They, they, they think he, everything he says and does is living inside of them. They've been hiding it behind their Bibles and their piety all these years. Every foul thing he says and every foul thing he does is living inside the rotted evangelical church. Come on. I've been in that all my life, but it's coming out. It's like the universe says, I'm going to show you what really lives in you, America. I'm going to show you what lives behind your Bibles and your pulpits and your crucifixes. I'm going to show you what's sitting up in them pews, smiling and grinning, talking about Jesus loves you. Uh, the whole world is laughing. Not just atheists, but people who have no respect, agnostics, but people who have been believers for years that have lost their faith in the institution, not in Christ or Christ conscious, but in this institution. Jesus called them whitewashed sepulchers. Yeah. He didn't say blackwashed. He said whitewashed sepulchers and vipers. That was equivalent of cussing. They went to turning tables over and bringing out whips. He was, uh, and, and I've been in that mode and asking God to help me while I'm fasting and praying not to turn some tables over. Uh, my, my, I, we're all on the Daniels fast and my sister said, I'm on my Jack Daniels fast because she's <laughs> she been drinking so much Jack Daniels <laughs> to, 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 to deal with all of this. So we're in a right now. Yeah, <laughs> being not filled with wine when it is excess. Didn't say not being not filled. <laughs> drinking all of it. <laughs> I got to laugh. Oh, no. But I understand. And I think I think that you're right. I think that is the time that we are in. It's the, the time for us to see. We haven't been able to see because so much has been kept from us. And because we are sort of, of, of you know, Pollyanna-ish about certain things. Like no one will ever make us believe that just a bunch of people could just walk into the people's building like that, bust through the doors, break down the windows, uh, hold each other up on on, a, on the window washing machines and and walk in and sit down in the place where our Congress meets. No, no one would ever have thought that such a thing could happen. So we didn't anticipate it, but now we know, because this is a time of revelation. A lot is being revealed. And we'll have a a lot is being revealed that we didn't know was underneath. And what you said is so there's a lot lot of things. And we come from um, leaders' families. And there was always something that we knew that everybody didn't know. And we had to make choices when you come from leaders' families uh, as to what it is that's real and what's Memorex. And I remember, uh, cause I'm reading um, this book by Brian McLaren, it's called Faith After Doubt. This is the book by the way. Wow. And, and it's actually a great book, but what it, what it does is it gives us the opportunity to look very deeply into and examine the things that we doubted all along, but we were never open and honest about it. And I remember, the experience of knowing too much, you know, when you when you're from a first family, you know who drinks and who's sleeping with who and, and yeah. who chews tobacco and you know, you know everything because you just know. Yeah. No. But at the same time, it's being preached against all over your head, you know. Well, well, and you're hearing it, and it's a dichotomy. You're trying to figure out well now, how is it that it's so wrong? But then this is the reality that this person or these people are actually living? Is, is there, is there a, something that I'm missing? Something different about how it's okay for some and not okay for others or how does that work? And if we are not mindful, it begins to feel like basically there is no truth. There is no foundation. There is, you know, and, and I remember one day thinking to myself, is there anything to any of this? Not because of what I didn't know, but because of what I did know. Yeah, yeah. I knew too much. And, and, and I know that there are a lot of people, to your point, that are seeing a lot. 
that's being done in the name of God and not done in the name of the nation and done in the name of the political good and all of that stuff. But at the same time, the people who are doing it are permitting for themselves whatever they, everything that the, that the religious right supports in Donald Trump's decision theologically in their thinking are things that he's guilty of. Yeah. <laughs> How does that work? <laughs> and so th there has to be a point at which we have to conclude that the, the message and the messenger are supposed to be kind of the same thing, right? Yeah. That's what's supposed to happen. When there's a dichotomy, it creates doubt. Now, the, the question for us, and all of us have to look at this closely, the question for us is, is what is our role as people of faith? Because we're also being made over by these experiences. What is our role as people of faith and how are we going to come out of this COVID? How, we, how, what, what is our hand going to be on this? Because people are, are, you are so right, Bishop Pearson, they are losing confidence in whether or not any of this stuff is real. If, if we will support some of the things that happened today and some of the things that have been happening over the last four years and to support them in the name of Jesus, in the name of God, in the name of what is holy, something is wrong with that. I had a choice. Either I could believe nobody was saved or I could believe that everybody was flawed and they wanted to look like they were saved and they was lying. Yeah. And I could let them, I could, I could deal with that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Humanity in that. I think this is going to be the prevailing mentality over the next probably 10 years. It's going to take about that long. And billions are going to say it, beginning with millions right here in the country. I'm one of them. Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. Help me survive my loss of faith my loss of trust in the integrity, excuse me if, if I offend somebody, even of your word, because it's full of contradictions, errors, and fallacies. It's, and you you know me, Bishop Thunder, that I'm you. We've been in this all our life. This is all we know. And I think, Bishop, like you too, this is, if you're cold, you get all, I don't know that, but, but this is all we know. To, to be able to say, you know what, I think we got it wrong. I think we heard it inaccurately. I think we need to reconsider what we believe and why we believe it and how those beliefs add to or subtract from the quality of our lives. Lord, I believe, help me where I don't. And I've been battling with this for over 20 years, quietly sitting in the, my church with traffic jams every Sunday. And I mean, the glory of God and the people of God and the presence of God and the power of God and the provision of God, money, Zeusa, traveling across the world and living among the, the, the TBN crowd and Jan Crouch, I mean, uh, Jim Baker and Tammy and Paul, uh, Pat Robertson, I, you know, that I did all that stuff, was in those circles, but I was always dealing with the help. My, I don't, I know some of this stuff is wrong. It's, it's lies, it's deception, it's BS, uh, 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 bias synapsis. Um, it's, and I can't handle it and I held it down as long as I could. Sure. And then it just came forth. And I am an example of millions of people who are saying I'm done with that. It served me in the last century well. It doesn't fit in my consciousness now. It doesn't fit in my character. It doesn't fit it with my inte spiritual integrity. It just doesn't. So I can't, and in this age that we're going into now, we're going to do that without apologizing. Yes. We're going to do it with boldness and confidence, and some people are going to call it arrogance. But the same Holy Ghost that dealt with us in the 20th century is dealing with us now, and we're just going forth. I can't avoid what has always worked in me with those, with those convictions, and you are a victim of what you believe in. When you are convinced, it has victory over you. And so people are breaking out. Here's what the word apostate means. Runaway slave. Look up its meaning. And they keep saying, Bishop, come back, come back, come back. I'm not coming back. I'm a runaway slave. I'm happy to say I'm part of the apostate church. Still the ecclesia. Call. 
<laughs> but runaway slaves, there's a new deliverance coming. There's a new anointing with the appointment. The appointment is to be free. We are free to eat from any tree or truth in the garden, except the one that says any of the other ones are bad. And if we do eat of that, we'll have an iPhone and an iPad with an apple with a bite out of it in the back. So it's all knowledge. It's good. good. Before you go, I want to um, say something that Senator Spearman just texted me. And yeah. we all know that Senator Spearman had not been well, but God is healing her and she's moving yeah. forward. And she says, remember our power at the polls. They yeah. lost their minds because we did not listen to their lies and machinations that our vote did not matter. Let's right. keep making them. Good um, point. That's it. Let's keep making them know that we have a right to vote. Vote in 2022 and 2024 and 2026. And she says she keeps speaking truth that we need to keep speaking truth and forcing accountability and voting. Yeah. And she's been saying for a long time, they are terrified when we vote. Oh, oh God. Wow. And, wow. and we, when we are not afraid and we're and basically we are not, you know, I think we've come to that place. But when we are not afraid, what happens is people try to dumb us down with other things. Mm. But when we are not afraid and simultaneously we are secure in our faith, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And we are secure in our our bloodline. We're secure in our race, we're securing our race identity. There's not a whole lot that can be done to hinder us from being our best and highest selves, no matter who is in the us. My heart says that she is right. We should vote, we should also apply for the jobs that we really want. Yeah. We should go to the schools that we really want to go to. We should we should not settle for a poor relationship. If you need a relationship, hang on till you get one that's got good sense. And that's what I just said. I think that what we need to be able to do what it is we at one time thought was too great for us to accomplish. That self confidence and self assurance is a deliverance. It's like a a, a, a new baptism for people whose consciousness has been made to think that if I could just get a seat on the bus in the back, then I'm grateful. But then you get a Rosa Parks, you get a Rosa Parks anointing and you decide you're gonna sit wherever a seat is empty. That changes yeah. the whole dynamic. It shifts everything. That's, I hear that in the spirit in so many, many ways. And I'm with, I'm with Senator Spearman, who is by the way getting more and more well every day. She's up walking around. She's a COVID survivor. Survivor. I didn't know she had it. Wow. Really, really, yeah, she's doing really well. So, so, so was Fred able to get back in? He's still having some technical difficulties and trying to get in. He's going to try to come in through his phone. But one of the things I wanted to also bring up um, just as we wait for him to try to get back in before we close up is I wanted to talk about New York and Rudy Giuliani. You know, they started off with a bad cast of characters. And if anybody, um, so he's not going to be able to get back on. But um, if anybody knows about what happened, how today started, it started off with Rudy Giuliani. That's what it I heard. Off with Rudy Giuliani calling for a trial by combat. I didn't hear that. Yes. And then followed by Eric Trump saying some of the same thing hmm. that... Uh, Rudy Giuliani said. And then finally we hear from Mitch McConnell as he spoke to the Senate today saying that we cannot imitate and escalate what we repudiate. This is too little too late. Yes, a great yeah. statement to make. And then he said what the president had caused today was an insurrection. Yes, also yes. correct. A great yes. statement to make, but also too little too late. Yes. The and wheels already started turning. Yes, Bishop. There's another um, piece that just came up because, you know, this the, re the Republicans are, are floating the idea of uh, removing President Trump. Yes. Uh, yeah. They want to do the 25th Amendment. 25th Amendment for all of these reasons combined because this is not the only act of violence. They want to be able to do this before the 20th. 
Yes. Before the inaugural, because the idea is that what he's going to use, because he's still the president and he can use the power. And and in some ways, he plans uh, to. Yes. Congress has got to be able to do what Twitter did. Yeah. They've got to be able to cut him off. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. right. Right. And if you cut him off, you cut off his money. Yeah. yeah. And you cut off his ability to to uh, enable a and number of people, for instance, that came today were probably given help and assistance to come essentially right. uh, to Washington, D.C. That's the point right. that I'm trying to make. Um, and I think that the 25th Amendment is appropriate. I'm one of the people who think that that when when the president of the United States incites a riot. Yeah. Insurrection. And in, an yeah. insurrection, yeah. the yeah. Congress intentionally fires them up, let his sons fire them up and then dispatch them. He sent them to the Congress at the time allotted essentially for them to start breaking into committee to have conversation. They were the most vulnerable in that moment. Yep. Sent somebody to them. Yes, the 25th Amendment needs to be applied. He and, needs to be pulled and, down. And he kept the National Guard away intentionally. Yes. Yep. Yes. He tells them to bomb people with, with yep. smoke and stuff when he wants to hold the Bible upside down in front of a church. Yep. But now all these people are attacking his Congress and he's the president and chief commander Commander in Chief, and he calls the has everybody stand away. S says stand. St what did he say? Stand, stand, stand down. down. Stand by. Stand, and stand, down. By. stand by. They were standing by, but not close. That's yep. right. He wanted damage. This man is so angry. He wants to tear down uh, Mitch McConnell. Now his yeah. vice president. He's going to go after him. He went right. after the governor of of Georgia, and this he doesn't care about the party. He is. If you're not on his side. You're the enemy. If you ain't for us, you're against us. That's his mentality. He's not through. He's going to rip into the evangelical church before it's all over and start tearing them yeah. down because their prophecies didn't work and they lied to him and Hilton. They didn't go to the polls. Or he's going to find some way to attack the church as well. Absolutely. Who, was it Pat Robertson? From, from who was it? Seven hundred coins. Yeah, seven hundred. Pat. Pat. Pat Robertson said that he was wrong. He apologized. Well, good for supporting him. I didn't hear that. Was that today? It was about a week ago. Uh, about a week ago. That he that he because he said he was going to win. He said he prophesied like the many. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I heard that part. He prophesied. But he he prophesied twice that he was going. That the Lord well, told. Him. And the, the Lord, Lord said it. Yeah. Didn't say that. He said, he said it. He said he was completely wrong, and that and he began to talk about some of the things that are flawed. In what that for some problem. reason he could not see and perceive. I said that's probably the the only gracious turnabout. That I have heard, in it, but before long, if you're attached to him, it's going to work to your detriment in several several different ways, and that's just the truth. It's not because I made it up; it is because it is absolutely what the end game is on that. That's yeah. it. We need to take him down while he has presidential power. That's, that's it. Cool. Right it's away, right. he's already he's already in mental breakdown, an emotional yeah. breakdown. This yeah. guy is a maniac. There's no he would do yeah. anything, say anything. Yeah. He's yeah. Like, uh, a bull in a china, uh, un, un has has un, completely unfiltered. Yeah. Yeah. He, was down, he was down in Mar-a-Lago last week, railing against his wife for certain things yeah. that she had done in the private quarters. He yeah. doesn't care who he hurts. He'll he turn or what he says, he had the nerve to get on national television and, and, and to quell the violence is what we wanted him to do. But what he did was started off inciting again by making fraudulent yeah. statements about it, uh, sub unsubstantiated F, you know, information about the election. Nobody knows what he's talking about. He tells them to the insurrectionist, he says, uh, he loves them. Yeah. Yes. He says, you are yeah, very special. You are yeah. very Special. Yeah. And then he says, go home in peace. Yes. Sure did. After they did all the damage, though. This was after yeah. they did all the damage. Absolutely. Right. After the fact. No he national guard ever came. He wants to be able to say, my people stood for me. They poured into Washington. They stood before the Capitol building. They went after those weak, gutless, ballless uh, senators. Yeah. These are the kind of patriots we need. Now, he told the mayors that allowed the Black Lives Matter protesters uh, that they should call a National Guard and they're not strong mm -hmm. enough. And the National, his that's his city. And he let them yeah. destroy it. Not the streets, yeah. they destroyed the most sacred grounds of our government. 
Yeah. The nation's capital, the cap, and, the head. And I think that I think that they have enough evidence to impeach him with Probably. the twenty fifth amendment. The reason why I and said it was if we go back through the timeline and look at some of the things he's done a month ago, he reshuffled the Department of Defense. Yes. Yeah. Y'all remember that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Reshuffling it, it was strategic. Yeah. Right? Because now he knows that he's stay with the poop. He's trying to get things in order because this is what he thought was going to take place. Commander. It was going to take place. And as Bishop Pearson said, Bishop Funder, it was an inside job. We know that people, somebody, what was happening. Somebody was telling them what time it is. This is the perfect time. Bring the people now. This is the moment that folks have gone into their different quarters, places to meet. There's nobody watching the door. This is the yep. most important they time. Yep. See, because all the guards had gone to the different places where they were meeting in the small groups. Yep. This was the perfect time to come and bum rush, essentially, the capital of the United States of America. It's a, And it is amazing. It is literally amazing. But according to the news, they're getting finished yep. tonight. Uh, and they are definitively having a discussion about the 25th Amendment, which I'm trying to see how that's going to work with the people who are pushing to redo the votes so that to find out if he really lost. I'm trying to figure out how Ted Cruz is responding to that. That's right. The, what do you say to that? Yep. It's the worst mistake Ted's ever made. And we yeah. know Ted's faking it because Trump said his wife is ugly and his daddy killed Kennedy. Yeah, I was like, wow. And Ted cussed about that. Yeah, and then he kept, but all these guys are, they're not thinking about principle. They're thinking about their political future. They're so afraid. Uh, well, Dr. Davies back. Yes. Open up your mouth. Open up your mouth. You're about to get to go. Come on, open up, open up your mouth. Can you hear me at all? Yes, Thank sir. Good, good. We can. Sorry about that. We can. We're glad so you're back. You. Say something, Fred, about what about yes. the fact that they're going back into the conversation tonight as the Congress to talk about what they're going to do. And that part of that discussion is about the 25th Amendment and the intention around that. And sort of what do you think they're going to be talking about now that this thing has happened and what is the possibilities around the 25th Amendment? I hear you. Now, at the risk of repeating, some of what may have already been said. Let me say first, I think the first thing I think the Congress should do is to, um, the Republicans should just stop the conversation about the legitimacy of the vote. Yeah. It, it could do the country a whole lot of good if they mm -hmm. would just certify mm -hmm. the Electoral College vote. Just to digress on that, we need to get rid of the Electoral College, but we should do that on another one of these discussions. Maybe. Exactly. Yeah. Abolish the Electoral College, yes. So mm -hmm. if they could do the country a lot of good to set aside the nonsense about this, not, you know, about corruption, about fraud, about mm -hmm. votes being stolen or votes being added, because there's simply no truth to that. It's been proven yeah. a thousand ways to Sunday. I suspect that if not, in fact, in reality, the 25th Amendment has already been invoked. Listening to the news, all the, the news just before coming on tonight, all the conversations were about conversations that have been had with Vice President Pence about the National Guard, about security, about what to do, about how to proceed. The president was completely out of the picture. I do, I do know, and maybe you all talked about this while I was having my technical difficulties, but there, was a, there, there were conversations going on in that interim period at the Congress because the vice president did not leave. They sequestered him at the Congress about the 25th Amendment and how to invoke it. And, uh, several news programs said that. Mm -hmm. I guess by the Constitution, you need, what, 20, you need half of the cabinet members Yes. To agree. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so I'm not going to be surprised if they don't do it or figure out a workaround. Um, but this president, you know, and I, 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 I'm just going to say it, I said it before, is mm -hmm. a present danger to the mm -hmm. United States of America. And I think every elected official, every congressional elected uh, person 
owes it to this nation. They took a, a vow, pledge to defend and support the Constitution of the United States of America. Mm -hmm. And now's the time, if there ever was one. So I hope they do it, uh, either in fact or uh, in practice. Um, um, I don't think that there's any alternative. I concur. If we let this slide, we, we don't we don't have a president. Basically, we have we have a angry man with a finger on the button. Yeah. Well, and we don't have a president or precedents. Right. Right. We have set a standard. Right. right. We have a guy who who Republicans have admitted. Yeah. Mitch Romney's statement tonight. He yes. the president of the United States has incited insurrection. And they got mad at him. Yeah. Called him a traitor. It's yeah. <laughs> It but, is true. It, and, but the president, the, the president of the United States is inciting insurrection. Yes, and absolutely. Sedition. We just talked and about that. mob, sent a mob to the a mob, mob yeah. to tear up the building. Yeah. A few yeah. thousand people. Yeah. I That's need incredible. to make clear a few thousand people. Yes. Not even a few hundred people. Right. A few thousand people. Yeah. And, and, and for them, that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As we said before, it's about race. Yes. For him, it's about sickness. The guy yeah. is mad. Um, he he is a he's a pathology. Not all narcissism. Maybe narcissism is a pathology, but I don't think all narcissists are pathological. Mm -hmm. But this guy's a pathological narcissist. I mean, mm -hmm. it's so deeply ingrained that he would take a whole country over a cliff just to satisfy his ego. Yes, that's, that's, that's a sickness, and he appeals to white racism. To get it done, that's demonic, um, and I, and these folks in Congress have an obligation to to put an end to this. Yes, not I'm tomorrow. One hundred percent. They are calling him the bad king. Yeah. Say that again, uh, Mr. Black. They are calling him the mad king. Yeah, no, it's really he is. I I call him the prince with uh, the uh, 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 prince without clothes. Mm -hmm. Emperor. Emperor, Emperor without, from the yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. With COVID, which plunged us into economic disaster as well as physical disaster. Yeah. Yes, it's psychological and biological warfare, but he's responsible for the state that the country is in right now. Right. right. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think and the, the lesson obvious. I don't see how right. it's not obvious. To people. Right. And I think there are two big lessons from this. And maybe it's one that just as we have to be worried about pathogens. Mm -hmm sort of entering into our system and mm -hmm. causing all, wreaking all kinds of havoc. They're human pathogens. Yeah. They enter into our system too. And we got to be on guard for both of them. And we can, never, we can never take either our physical health for granted or the health of this nation. You just mm -hmm. can't. You know, you just can't take it for granted because these things, are, they're going to slip, they'll slip up on us. And one of these times, and that, I guess that's the lesson, that if we want this thing to last, just as we want our bodies to be healthy, we have to pay attention. Yes. We have to pay attention. Yes, sir. And, I think uh, it's also very important to note that this was a super spreader today. Yeah, yeah. totally. Yeah. 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 A super, super spreader. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And if, and if we don't wake up from this, if this isn't a reckoning, if this isn't a time for responsible people responsible people collectively to say we're going to do this thing a different way then 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 you know we may end up with a different kind of nation mm -hmm. but i'm hoping that all people of goodwill will say we believe in democracy we believe in mutuality and respect we want to do this thing together domination and control no longer works whether it's over the environment or over each other so let's figure out how we live in harmony, both with the environment and with each other, and make a go of this thing. I'm really yeah. hoping we'll find enough people, a critical mass, who are willing to do that. Absolutely. And uh, Bishop Pearson, to support something that you said earlier, Senator Spearman sent me another text, and she said, strip all members of Congress who participated in this insurrection of committee assignments and majority leader and speaker should refuse them seats on the floor and in committee rooms, let them go and sit in their office all day. Good. Then come out with no power. Good. 
And don't even give him a sandwich. Yeah. I love it. That's what I said. I, I, said, I said, censor them, but strip them is the more powerful word. And I think these folks, two of those, two of those senators came from Oklahoma. In mm -hmm. Hoffman, 84, he had been supporting it, but he's not going to run again, so he didn't support it. But the other two younger ones did, I'm embarrassed. But they were the only state that had two senators to be a part of that 12. Yeah. Uh, they, they, they need to be stripped. I agree 100% with you. And to her last point, the American people, white men specifically, let me read that again. The American people, white men specifically, must condemn these actions. Yes. Yes. Indeed. And then there's another thing that's coming up that I think is important too. A number of the people that work now for the administration said they're going to quit. Yeah. Well, the, well, Melania Trump's um, chief of staff yes. already quit today. She did. I didn't hear that. Wow. Yes. Was, there's somebody who just said it. Trump's national security advisor. That's quit. He was acting anyway, I think. Yeah. yeah. Um, because oh, of the yeah. riot. Oh, and right. there are people that they just don't want themselves attached, and that's the way it is, you know. Yeah. And God well, only knows what He's demanding of them. You know that's going to come out too. Yeah. When it's all about Everybody's yeah. walking on eggshells. Everybody knows what He wants to hear, and if you tell Him the truth, which He doesn't want to hear, He attacks you. And they're so—I mean, they're terrorized. This is terrorism. By well, this. did you see where He attacked Oprah? In yeah. this thing today, I mean, no. it's like, yeah, you uh, don't even uh, know why. <laughs> yeah, like somebody said he attacked like three African Americans, three black people before he even got into his main message. I don't know what's been what about the road after Oprah, but he did have some Oprah remarks. He had some a couple he, days he ago. Did. Yeah, well, he went after her again at this rally today because she's successful. Yeah, I, I think that's what. And not in his corner. And not, and she's not pulling for him. And she and she's a better business person than he is. Everybody's a better business person than he is. <laughs> he's he's never been poor. Right. You know, Donald Trump was the accident accidental president. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, America should we should never have done it. I do think the Russians had something to do with it. I do think he, I do think both Putin. I and Turkey, Terror, Erdogan, they, they both have something on right Yep. Yeah. yeah. Have you, a you, you noticed that they hacked us right in the middle of all this conflama. Yeah. No. They're playing with and hacked it. They're playing with it. They've got a doofus puppet in there that they can pull the strings with. They're having a ball. The Chinese, yeah. and he's insulted. They're calling it the China virus. He still has yeah. that racism, in, but he never says one thing negative about Putin. And Putin's behind all of this. Of Have course. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And I know they laugh. They sit down and just fall out laughing. But yeah. Putin, he wants to be. That's the yeah. thing. To right. have right. the power where you can poison people and just say, I didn't do right. that. Right. And, he and, and in those private conversations that we will never know anything about unless the interpreter decides to make them public. Right. Putin could have had a conversation with him about just how to do this. Yes. Sure. I could see De that. Delegitimize all your institutions. Yeah. Delegitimize your elections and then declare yourself in control. That's it. Which and have enough people. And you got to right. have to have enough people to support you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And treat them the way you need to and who you need to. Right. Absolutely. Calm them and hold them down. They know what they're doing. Well, I feel my ancestors saying it ain't getting ready to happen. Right. Yeah, no, not now. Thank God for Georgia. Yeah. Indeed. Indeed. Thank God. Yes. Thank God for the end of Mitch McConnell in his role. Yes. Oh Thank God for a brand new day. I pray for the safety of yes. the incoming president and vice president. Amen. Oh, the people that they are choosing, I would say 75% of them I support. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Amen. And I pray that um, all of us will have an active role in the faith council. And we've had some conversations and, you know, let them know when you talk to them too, Fred. Okay. That I, I think that a counter to a lot of what has been put out there around um, evangelical Christianity in particular, but because there's so little out there about progressive Christianity, I think it's important that we have a hand on this to, 
to right. because we've been in these places. We know about these places. Mm -hmm. We know about these places. <laughs> well, let's go back to where we started, Bishop. Yes. And to your point about uh, progressive Christianity. Yes, sir. We have a spokesperson for progressive Christianity in the Senate now. Thank and God. I think there's more, there are a lot of articulate voices about progressive Christianity. Yeah. Yes. I don't think there's a more articulate voice about right. it. Oh my God, yes. I, and right there in the Senate. Let, right me, in put, the Senate. let me clap my hands. Hold on. Overnight almost. Overnight. Overnight. Thanks to God. Yes. Thanks to God. And the voice will be a, a counter to so many things, so many powerful and important. And then we won't have just hopefully a Christian council. We'll go back to something we did when Barack uh, was president, when President Obama was in office, where we will have faith people to impact this administration from many different yeah. belief groups. Yeah. Imagine, we should have known something was wrong when the whole faith council was evangelical Christians. Right. Well, Christian supremacy is as bad as white supremacy. Oh, it sure is. It might be worse. Yeah, it might be worse. You're absolutely you right. Can, you can be black and be in it. I mean, I'm yep. just saying. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> it's true. It's true. It is so we, true. Do we have questions at all? I don't see any questions, Bishop Flanker. Yeah. Um, because right. usually they show up in our chat, um, and I don't see any. Nope, we do not. We did a great job tonight. Yeah, we did. Oh, I'm glad I was able to get back. Oh, we're glad you're back. You yeah. know, we have we loved having you. You're a wonderful discussion partner. Thank you. And you know, when we get get where we can touch each other and hug each other, we want to come. We we do to spend some time at the school and, and love on each other and look each other in the eye and write edicts for the nation. How about that? I think it's going to be a real good opportunity. I look forward to it too. We need to get Bishop Pearson to tell his whole story in a book. Yes. yes. I need you to help me to talk him into doing that from the beginning to the all end. the way through now. He is. Mm -hmm. That's a volume. So, yeah, but it's necessary. So some people that are on that trajectory will find hope in yes. many, many ways. I believe that. So so says the beautiful spirit. Indeed. That's right. All right. I love you all. Love you. Love you all. Have a great Thank night. You. I appreciate you all for joining us. We have a few announcements that are going to come up. And here they go. And so we have the Healing Place Apothecary. We're so grateful for a newbie in Flunder. She is the daughter of our presiding bishop, and she's the founder of the Healing Place Apothecary. Please go to her website, the Healing Place THP Apothecary.com, and go and buy some of her products. They are quite wonderful. Apply now, Harlem Pride. Uh, is having free entrepreneurship workshop February 3rd to April 28th. And uh, Vaughn Williams is the founder of Activate Increase, and she is the instructor. And you'll be they'll be talking about work on real projects and learn, mission vision development, business structure, business management, business finance and planning, marketing and promotions. And so you can put in the application. The deadline is January 15th at 5 o'clock. The website is here. Um, the email address is here, info at harlempride.org weekly on Wednesdays from seven to eight. So if you want to be a part of that, uh, please, please, please make sure you sign up. And we have Kyra Solutions. Focus on your passion. Let Kyra handle the rest. Administrative business and consulting services for dreamers, visionaries, entrepreneurs, faith and community-based organizations. Just go to www.kara, K-A-R-A hyphen solutions with an S dot com. That is Pastor Sue Webley's business. And if you want to advertise with us, it's uh, $30 for 30 seconds. Just come to our uh, email address and email us beyond the gatekeepers show at gmail.com. That's beyond the gatekeepers show at gmail.com.
Thank you for joining us. Please support this and future broadcasts by sending a donation via Cash App to dollar sign TFAM Annual. That's dollar sign TFAM Annual. We hope that you enjoyed the show on tonight. Our credits go to protest song intro is Medine, and our outro will be Georgia on My Mind by Ray Charles. Thank you. Have a great night.